So thank you very much for coming today evening and I apologize for being late. So we'll focus on the potential, not the problem. <laughs> not the problem of being late, but the potential of what we can do with the remaining time that we have now with us. So <clears throat> I got this first first experience when I was about 12 of the power of attitude. We all heard about it at different times in our life. But it was at this particular time, I didn't verbalize it that way, but it was on. Do I need to press it like this or? Okay. Yeah. That actually our attitude towards a problem determines the effect of that problem on us. At one time, I was, when I was a student, I loved to play chess. And I was a part of our school team which would go and uh, participate in the competitions. And just before I was supposed to be a, leading our team to a competition, just before that I fell sick. And I felt so upset. I got some flu, some fever. And I felt so upset. I had practiced for months and years. And that was supposed to be a big breakthrough for me. And while that was I was just beating myself up, feeling upset about the way things had turned out. Then at that time, a friend came and gave me a book, which I had been wanting to read for a long time. This was India in the 1990s, and there was no Amazon at that time. So it was a, West, it was a book published in America. So getting that book was not easy. I had been wanting to get it for a long time. And somehow he unexpectedly brought it at that time and gave it to me. And I was so happy to see that book. And then for the next five, six hours, I was reading that book. And then after that, a friend just came to meet me. He says, I'm sorry you, uh, that you couldn't go for the competition. Are you OK? I said, what competition? Mm -hmm. I realized I had completely forgotten about it. So what, this, what that incident as I said, I didn't verbalize it that way at that time, but actually it is life that determines our problems. But it is the way we approach them, what we think of, where we direct our thought energy, that determines the size of those problems. So life determines our problems, we determine their size. And we determine their size by how we think about them and how much we think about them. So for me at that particular situation, obsessing over the fact that I could not go for that competition would have been useless. So normally if we consider, if it's a physical problem if we have, say if we have to carry a trolley in the, airplane, from the, in the airport, if it's a heavy trolley, then the more we push, the more energy we apply, the further the trolley will go. So the, the distance covered is proportional to the energy applied. That's how it works in the physical domain. But in the domain of thoughts, it doesn't work like that. It is not that the more we think about a problem, the more we come up with a solution to the problem. So if we consider a correlation with respect to physical problems, it's straight linear correlation. The more energy, the greater the movement that will be there. But with respect to uh, mental aspect, problems that affect us emotionally, mentally, the graph, we could say, it rises up linearly, attains a plateau, and then falls down. That means when we have a problem, we do need to think about it. If we just impulsively, thoughtlessly respond to it, that response can itself aggravate the problem. But when we think about it, at a particular point, we come to optimum. After that, 
thinking about it doesn't help with dealing with it. It just seems to go, our thoughts don't seem to go anywhere. And then after some time, if we keep thinking, rather than give leading to greater clarity, it leads to greater apathy, greater resentment. So actually, the problem far from being solved, it becomes aggravated. One of my friends is a painter and he is telling me that when you are painting, there is a particular point at which the painting looks the best. Any a few strokes less doesn't look good. And a few strokes more also it doesn't look good. So you have to stop at the right point. So underpainting is a problem, overpainting also is a problem. I, I also write books and I have friends with many people who are writers. So there's one the author who, one of my friends who was who consulted many, many people before finalizing his book and he took their inputs from everyone. And then finally he told me, now I don't know whether it is my book or it's someone else's book. <laughs> because when you take so many people's opinions, then it just, the one's voice and one's message may get lost in that. So just like there can be under editing and there can be over editing. There is over editing, then the person gets, the voice and the message gets choked. So some, something similar applies to thinking. So all of us in our life face problems. And we do need to think about problems. Otherwise, we cannot deal with them. But how we think about the problem can be a part of the solution or it can become a part of the problem itself. So what do I mean by, I think this is a part of the problem now. <laughs> what do I do exactly? Okay. As I mentioned, our thought energy, if it is dissipated, then, li uh, a, then life determines our problems, but we determine the size. If we keep thinking again and again and again of something that has gone wrong in our life, then we just get drained out by it. It is something like, suppose we see a sports match in which some very exciting event has happened. Or if we see a movie in which there are some very attract, very captivating scenes, then we may want to replay those scenes again and again and again. Because we want to get every drop of pleasure through that. So those replays give pleasure. But suppose there are some ghastly, horrible scenes and somebody keeps replaying them again and again and again. We say, stop it now, move on. Like sometimes some, some unpleasant, unsavory scenes are there. We say, I just don't want to see this. Just do fast forward. But our mind often does the opposite. It just keeps replaying the negative that has happened. And as it keeps replaying, the problem seems to become bigger and bigger. So this is an important thing to understand about our thoughts that the problem is here, we are here, our thoughts are here. Our thoughts have no power over us till we give them our thought. What do I mean by this? Our thoughts have no power over us till we give them our thought. It means that firstly the word thought can be used in two different senses. One is, you may say, I have given this a lot of thought. The second is, I just got a thought. Do you notice the difference? I just got a thought means something has popped up in, in, in our, inside us, some idea, something has popped up. It's, I just got a thought. I have given this a lot of thought means I have contemplated it. I have analyzed it. And I have come to some understanding in this. Oh, so when a thought pops up within us, okay, this problem is there. It's like a pop-up on a screen on our device, phone or computer. When it pops up, at that time, say we are studying for an exam and suddenly we get a not notification. Our friend has changed their cover photo. Mm. Or anything. Oh, I want to see what photo they have put. And then we see that, hey, this photo looks nice. Where did they get that photo? We start going on the timeline and seeing 
Okay, did they get it here? What were they doing over here? And one click links to another, to another, to another. And you spend hours, which you could have used for studying, never get distracted. So now when the window notification pops up over there, it's up to us to decide whether we look at it or not. So our thoughts have no power on us till we give them power by our thought, by thinking about it. That means the first level, a thought is like a pop-up window that comes on our screen. And the second is when we click on it. So basically for us, when we are facing problems, the, the thought of the problem is like a pop-up within us. And then if we click on it, it will just consume our consciousness. And we may overthink the problem and create trouble for ourselves. So to understand these two meanings of the word thoughts and to get a better sense of the inner dynamics, I'll offer a model of the self and then I'll talk about, a th I'll describe a thought experiment that we can do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so basically if we consider our existence, this is a model based on the ancient yoga text, the Bhagavad Gita. It explains that our existence is three level, body, mind and consciousness. And this is like the hardware, the software and the user. Within this, if we consider we, the consciousness are the observers. So I got a thought means the thought popped up on the mind. I have given this a lot of thought means I have analyzed this. So when a pop-up comes up, we think carefully. Do I need to do I need to click it right now? Well, should I click it later? Or I don't need to click this at all. So that's the two meanings of the word thoughts. And so when we talk about problems, there may be a problematic situation at the level of physical reality. Yes. You know, I've got a I've got a project guide who is very demanding or I don't have, I have to deal with the subject and I'm not so good in the subject. My health is not good. Uh, there can be real problems out there at the physical level. And that we have to address practically. But at the mental level, our approach towards the problems will determine how well we can address those problems. So we are going to focus on this mental level. Go ahead. So let's do a thought experiment now. Wherever you are, you can sit comfortably and close your eyes. With your eyes closed, now you can take three deep breaths. One, two, three. Now, as your deep breathing is going on, observe your own body. Think of which all parts of the body are tense and try to relax them. A simple way to do this is to first do the opposite. You can take your right fist, right hand's fist and clench it as tightly as possible. And as you clench it, take a deep breath and when you release the breath, release the clenched fist. As the breath goes out, you feel your body relaxing. Repeat it once again. Clench your fist, take a deep breath, release the breath and clench the fist. As you observe, your body seems to be relaxing. Now, add one more element to this exercise. Visualize your hand. You can, on your mind's eye, visualize your hand as you are clenching it and as you are unclenching it. And you can sen not only sense through the sensation of the touch, but see with your mind's eye also how your hand and your fist is tightening and relaxing. So once again, 
breathe in tighten your fist visualize all this on your inner screen then breathe out and unclench you can do it once again as you observe your hand on the inner screen you can feel the tension within you going down further try this once more as you're looking at the hand on your inner screen you observe yourself you observe your hand tightening into a fist breathe in breathe out unclench the hand feel the tension going out of your body and notice that you can sense your hand as it is relaxing and you can see your hand in front of you in your mind's eye and there also you can see the hand unclenching and relaxing there is the physical hand which is below you there is the mental representation of the hand which is in front of you and there is you who is the observer of both the hand and the mental representation of the hand so the hand is a part of the physical you the visual image of the hand that you saw on your screen that is a part of the mental you that is your mind and the seer of both of them is the spiritual you the real you the consciousness you can take one deep breath and then you can open your eyes thank you so let's look at this once again yeah so what i explained just now whenever we perceive things there is the outer scene say so you are looking at me i am looking at you then there is the inner screen and there is the inner seer so the outer screen is the mind the inner seer is the soul the consciousness most of the times when we face problems we are caught in looking at the outer screen i think i have this is the problem so i have to deal with it but the inner screen can distort our perception and it can make a problem seem to be bigger than what it actually is and seeing that magnified problem can discourage us to get another example of this dynamic how it works say after this program suppose you have some nice food don't suppose you have food after this program <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but suppose there is a there's a nice desert would any of you like to share what is your favorite desert jalebi jalebi <laughs> okay most of you probably would not know what a jalebi is you know no okay anyone else knows i want you to visually be able to visualize the desert some desert which everybody is familiar with anyone else donuts donuts okay okay so now suppose somebody loves donuts and they have come for a program and they know and that the program at the end as a part of the feast donuts are there and then throughout the program they are waiting when will the donuts be there when will the donuts come <laughs> when will the donuts come and then when the feast is served they find there are no donuts what happened <laughs> what happened they come to know that oh actually the person who was bringing the donuts he slipped and fell down and all the donuts spilled off oh i feel disappointed i feel annoyed i feel angered but suppose in that same program there is someone who has just a couple of days ago been diagnosed with diabetes and they love donuts and they know that there are donuts in the program and it is going to be torture for them to see everybody else eating donuts and they not be able to eat because of their diabetes and when they come to know there are no donuts 
what is their reaction <sighs> relief so the event is the same but it is the conception in the mind the inner screen that determines our emotion our emotions and our experiences are determined not just by the events but also by our expectations or our conceptions of that event so therefore if we understand this the problem is out there at the level of the outer scene but the problem can be magnified or minimized by how it appears on the inner screen and to do this we need to understand that i am different from the outer screen and i am different i am different from the outer scene and i am different from the inner screen i am the observer of both like in the thought exercise you observe your hand in terms of sense it relaxing and tensing but then you also saw it so basically if you understand that every experience of ours especially every major experience it has these three levels then we can learn to deal with our problems in a more productive way by shifting our focus more positively so what does it mean when we say that we should <coughs> we can focus on potentials not on problems this is that actually what matters most is that there is a problem out there but our perception that's what we can change so even if we can't be grateful for all situations we can be grateful in all situations the difference between the two is what we are focusing on sometimes bad things happen sometimes terrible problems are there and you just can't do much about it the problems are there so we can't possibly be grateful for all situations because bad things happen in life but when these bad things happen we can choose to focus not on that situation but on the bigger picture i was in sydney a few months ago and there i met a person he has survived 17 cancer attacks till now he is 17 he had cancer he did some chemotherapy or uh, <coughs> radiotherapy and cancer went off relapse so last 17 years it's like a like every year cold season comes so every year he has a cancer season the cancer comes he takes therapy it goes cancer comes therapy it goes but when i talk with him i was amazed he was so positive he was so positive and he told me that when this cancer came for the first time it was terrible i was so depressed i was so dejected but then he was he was also practicing spirituality and when he is practicing spirituality he read in the texts of bhakti yoga of how throughout history great people great saints have also suffered and he read about one particular great saint and he felt that that saint instead of focusing on the problem just turned towards the divine focused on the divine and he was able to tolerate that problem so he said i try to do that so after talking with him i tried to analyze what he had done and i tried to put in my own thought process so i came up with a acronym what does it mean to that we can be grateful in all situations how can we be grateful in all situations so this is a three point acronym ice so that is we when bad things have happened we can look at the good in spite of the bad then we can look at that good which helps us to counter the bad and then we can look at the good that may emerge from the bad so i c e in spite of counter and emerge so what does this mean practically it means that for all of us if we look at our life bad things have happened but many good things have also happened in our life we all have certain abilities we all have certain resources and 
there are many good things if you look at them. Either we can choose to count our problems or we can count our blessings. And if we count our blessings, then at that time, you look at all the good things that have been happening in my life. That itself creates positive. Life is not so rotten. Life is not so unfair. Many good things have also happened in my life. When I was about less than one, my parents took me to a doctor. I was living in a remote town in India. And at that time there was the, the poss there was a danger of people getting polio. So the government recommended that we do vaccination. So my parents gave the vaccine, went to a doctor and gave the vaccine to me. Uh, I don't remember all this, but my parents told me later. But somehow the doctor who was supposed to give the vaccination, the doctor had messed up the vaccine. He had not kept it properly in the fridge. So the vaccine, after they gave it to me, the vaccine instead of protecting me from the polio, the vaccine gave me the polio. And then the next day I was just walking along. I had just learned to walk a few days. I was walking along and suddenly I fell down. I could never walk normally after that. And then as I grew up, over the years, now I use crutches early as using braces for walking. So after about 15, 20, 20, 25 years, I once went to address a group of people who were physically handicapped. And I was talking, I gave, I gave a talk on how spirituality can help us to overcome our limitations. And then after that, I was talking with them. And one thing struck me that most of them were still fighting battles that they had already lost. Fighting battles that they had already lost means that something terrible had happened. They had lost a limb, they had lost their, some of them had lost their eyes, some of them had lost their speech, some of them lost their ears. It's, it's, it seems to be very insensitive to speak like this. It's a great loss. But it's done and gone. And you, you have, if you keep fighting a battle that is already lost, why did this happen to me? If only I had done this, this wouldn't have happened. If only this had been done, it wouldn't have happened. So then I started looking back at my life and I don't remember resenting what had happened to me too much. And I was wondering about it, I introspected a little bit and I realized that as I grew up, my parents never made me feel in any way deficient. My parents never made me feel that actually my that I was deficient or I was weak. My parents wouldn't say, say that you know, whatever you lack in physical ability, you have been blessed with in intellectual ability. So I have no memory of walking normally. And when I come anywhere, the crutches are what people see most. But for me, my crutches are like my glasses. They're just a part of me. But if we start using glasses, how often do we notice that we have glasses? Yes, we need it, but we move on with it. So here, what, I, what struck me at that time is that for all of us, when bad things happen, nobody wants bad things to happen. But if we keep obsessing over that, then we can't move on with life. If we are fighting a battle that is already lost, what are we going to gain by it? It's, we all have certain expectations of life. And our expectations can help us to shape life positively. So here I'm talking about these two points, in spite of and counter. So good in spite of the bad. That means if we keep looking at the bad, why did this have to happen? Why did this have to happen? Why did this have to happen? Then uh, we just, we can't see anything positive that may be there in our life. Just bad, bad, bad is there. It's there. It's over now. Sometimes, I say, if, uh, as I said, if we have expectations in life, the expectations can help us to shape reality. If I study and I expect, I want to come first in my class, I want to get this much uh, CGP, uh, GPA, then that inspires me to study, to perform, to do whatever is required. But sometimes life just throws a curveball at us. And say, we are here, our expectations are here, the reality is here. So expectations are what come at the level of the inner screen and the reality is at the level of the physical scene. Or suppose somebody wanted to learn rowing and they wanted to exhibit their skills to their friends and loved ones. You know, how nicely I've learned to row, how swiftly, how smoothly, how gracefully. And they've spent weeks and months learning 
and then they call their friends come and see and then when they get into the boat and they're rowing and suddenly a monster wave comes from nowhere and the wave just knocks everything now the boat is not there the oars are also not there and they keep moving paddling keep moving their hands they'll sink isn't it at that time the thing is okay the life's changed now they have to simply swim back and get to safety and later on they can see how to deal with that but if they're caught why did this happen i planned to row i was going to row elegantly well without any oars without any boat if you keep rowing it's not just stupid it's suicidal will drown so basically uh, the the expectations are meant to help us shape reality if you have a dream oh, this is this is how i want to graduate and i want to get this degree and i'll show the photo to my friends and this and that these dreams we have these expectations and they help us to shape reality that's good in that in that sense expectations can help us but sometimes if reality changes drastically then holding on to the expectations simply wastes our energy so the we are he, the, we are here the expectations are here the reality is here the expectations can help us to shape the reality but if the expectations simply come in the way of our dealing with reality if our expectations make us deny reality then we end up we are caught in dealing with the expectations why didn't this happen why didn't this happen why didn't this happen but the reality is different so we need to have this psychological flexibility the flexibility by which we can distance ourselves from our expectations and focus on the reality having expectations is not the problem but being attached to the expectations is the problem psychological rigidity means our thoughts get locked in our expectations if somebody is rigid they just don't bend so psychological rigidity means we get locked into our expectations and that psychological rigidity prevents us from dealing with reality psychological flexibility means that okay i had these expectations but now reality is different so i withdraw my thoughts from the expectations and focus them on the reality so this capacity can be can be developed if we do this thought exercise so look at the good in spite of the bad okay this bad thing has happened but this was good this was good this was good this was good in my life and then look at the good that helps us to deal with the bad that helps us to counter the bad so i was talking with this friend who had got cancer so many times he told me that i look at the good and i said that you know, i have health insurance i have overall good health i have a very supportive family i have a helpful community around me the particular kind of cancer that i have it is curable so he look at all those positives and that help him to deal with it so if we are studying to for a particular career and somehow we are not get, getting through in that career then we may decide okay this is not working but still i am young i am willing to work hard i have intelligence and i can find some way forward so if we focus on the bad only we disempower ourselves so the first is a general habit that we need to develop generally try and make a habit of counting our blessings what are the good things that have happened in my life and keep a list of that if we, if we have a habit of becoming negative of obsessing over problems then keep that list with us readily and count it and look at it periodically and then when we have this list ready when a problem comes up then sh make a short list from that list of which of these blessings can help me to deal with this problem and then we don't feel so powerless although that has happened but we don't feel so powerless and the third is that if we are patient sometimes from the bad good can emerge Uh, it's not that the bad thing is good but every bad thing 
it can be like a fire that burns us to ashes or that it can be a fire that cleanses us and makes us shine further if <clears throat> if something is if we put wood in fire the wood will burn to ashes but if we put gold in fire then the gold will shine further the gold won't burn to ashes but the gold will shine further similarly we all can choose whether we want to be like wood or whether we want to like fire sorry i like gold the fire is the problem that we are going to face and we are all going to be put in fire sooner or later we can't avoid that and this is where the spiritual world view comes into the picture our spirituality helps us to understand that we are not like the wood yes there is wood around us but we are the gold within at the level of the body at the level of the mind many things can go wrong but we are not any of these things we are different from this we are different from our situations we are different from our emotions we are the inner seers we are the consciousness we are the indestructible spiritual being and realizing this realizing our spirituality is a vital opportunity and a vital power that we all can have yeah so this is where our consciousness comes into the picture say all of you are young you are planning now in future you will have a job and you can have a lot of money as a spiritualist i travel across the world as a spiritual teacher and i have met thousands of people and i've talked with even people who are billionaires and people who are average middle class or even lower middle class people and what i have seen is that there is no clear correlation between happiness and wealth and even sociologists have also said this that if below the poverty line if there's no money people people are in distress and from below the poverty line to above the poverty line there's a linear correlation between money and happiness but beyond that it's it's very wild sometimes a wealthy person may be very happy sometimes a wealthy person may be miserable sometimes the poor person some middle class person may be happy some middle class person may be miserable so actually what determines happiness and dis- happiness and distress is not how much money we make but what we make with the money money is a resource it's a important resource but it is simply a resource similarly grades which are our tools so that we can get a job and have a career and earn money earn money that's also a tool so when we see things in proper perspective this is a resource i need it but it doesn't define me it doesn't define me that we our self worth when we understand our spirituality that we are that consciousness we are that inner seer then we understand that our self worth is greater than our net worth whatever we may earn that doesn't define us that defines one part of us you know our gpa doesn't determine our self worth we are different from it yes this is matters so we will invest our energy in that but we won't reduce our self conception to that the various process of spirituality can you go ahead yeah so how do we f- as i said i have concluded this part now three p's that when we have a particular problem i said we shift our vision using the eyes to how we can deal with the problem how we can be grateful amidst the situation uh, if we can't be grateful for the situation but we can be grateful in the situation then after that when we want to look how do i deal with the situation practically so we can look at these three things you know first p potential is what am i good at the world may tell us you have to be like this you have to be like that you have to be like that you have to be like that but we don't have to become what the world is telling us to become we look inwards to see what am i good at then secondly what do i feel strongly about all of us are meant to make a contribution so in the world there are many problems in our life also there are many problems we can't solve all of them but that doesn't mean that we just feel sorry for ourselves and don't deal with any of them 
we focus on that which we can deal with what do we feel strongly about and then what do i deeply believe in that by doing this i'm going to make a contribution that i can make a difference by this so if you look at this the potential the problem and the process or somebody may feel that okay i saw my relative another small child dying because of not having proper medical care they may say i want to become a doctor and want to offer medical care so that's a potential okay am i good at science am i good at biology there's a problem there's a potential there's a process then let me study and direct myself so this is something which we have to do individually and by our spirituality we can get the calmness and the clarity to observe ourselves not as the world wants us to be but as we actually are and by such observation we can find out how we can contribute to the solution solution to our problem and solution to the bigger problems so the process of meditation especially mantra meditation that we can do this can raise our consciousness from the physical to the mental to the spiritual and once we are risen to the spiritual then we can observe ourselves calmly and we can deal with the situation appropriately like if we are in the ocean the waves will be tossing us but if we are lifted out of the ocean we are in a helicopter above we will we won't be tossed about by the waves even if we are not lifted above if somebody is in a helicopter above and they throw a rope down to us and we hold on to that rope then also we won't be tossed that much by the waves so our spirituality is like that rope so the practice process of spirituality if we practice it that can help us raise our consciousness upwards and then we can address this properly the last point now yeah it's whenever we face any problems it's always better to light a candle than to curse the darkness sometimes we're just walking along a road and it goes dark we can't see anything now whenever suddenly the power goes off i have not seen america power going off often unless there's a big hurricane or something like that <laughs> in india it is quite common when power goes off unexpectedly the first reaction is people people moan people curse people yell but that's natural but after a few moments then we try to take out our flashlights we take out our phone turn on the flashlight now the flashlight cannot replace the room light or the street light uh, but the flashlight can show us one step forward and we take that one step forward and then we see another step we take that further step forward we can see the path for another step and we can move forwards so when we are in a difficult situation in a situation we can't feel grateful about we will feel resentful about that situation then instead of thinking why has this light gone off how can i turn on one candle how can i turn on one flashlight so take that positive attitude take that one step forwards and that's our spirituality helps us understand that we are we are indestructible and we are a part of something bigger than ourselves so when we light a candle it is not just we who are lighting the candle actually something bigger than us can act through us and we will find that if we keep taking steps consistently gradually not only will the light come back not only the street lights will come back but we will find that we have developed ourselves internally better we have become stronger internally we have dev found the capacity to turn on the light within us and that is an immeasurable gain the realization that our spirituality can help us face whatever problems we may be facing we may come that may come our way in our life that is a immeasurable gain whatever life may get us to our spirituality can get us through whatever life may get us to our spirituality can get us through so i'll summarize what i spoke and then you can have a few questions if any of you have i spoke on the topic of how to <coughs> focus not on problems but on potentials i started with talking of how, how 
when our thought we put our thoughts in dealing with certain issues so the thoughts are like an energy they don't have a linear correlation with dealing with the problem the more if we don't think then we will get into trouble but if we think too much that will also get into trouble it's not a linear correlation it's linear up to a particular point it's it hits a plateau and then it goes down overthinking can aggravate our situation problems so life determines our problems we determine their size i talked about my chess game frustration and then reading that book and absorption when we forget everything and then i talked about how to shift we try to understand the dynamic of our thoughts thoughts can refer to events that just occur a pop up that appears on the screen or thought get off will also refer to the contemplation that we do systematically our thoughts have no power on us till we give them our thought i talked about three level model body mind and soul uh, and consciousness they are like the hardware software and user it is a thought experiment which explains how we as inner seers are different from the physical scene could sense our hand clenching and unclenching and we are different different from the inner screen where we can see that hand and visual representation over mental representation over there so we are different from scene and the screen we are the seer and understanding that we are the seer can actually calm us down amidst difficulties so we, even if we can't be grateful for all situations we can be grateful in all situations by looking at the i thought of three things i c e i was the good in spite of the bad cultivate a habit of counting our blessings instead of our problems c was the good that helps us to combat the bad so if we lose a if we lose our if we get a disease or whatever goes wrong look at the good that is helping us to deal with that and last was e was emerge the good that may emerge from the bad so the problems of life like like a fire if we are too caught up at the physical or the mental level of reality then we are like a wood we'll get burned by that fire reduced to ashes but if we focus on our spirituality realize that we are at our core spiritual and indestructible then we become like the gold which is actually which shines better when it goes to the fire and for doing this for focusing on the potential not the problem i talked about the three p's that focus on the what you are good at what we feel strongly about and what we believe strongly in so look at a potential that we have look at a problem that we desire to address and think of a process that inspires us to deal with that and for having the inner clarity and serenity to deal with this we need to raise our consciousness to the spiritual level that gives us security and even if suddenly the lights in our life go off we can still turn on the flashlight that flashlight is by focusing on our spirituality and thinking what can one step can i take forwards what one step can i take forwards and eventually by this not only will we grow through the situation and have the inner external lights come back but we will grow in our spirituality also and whatever life may get us to our spirituality can get us through thank you very much okay. So are there any questions or comments? Yes, please. Yeah, yourself. Okay. Um, hey, I just wanted to say thank you so much for sharing your ideas, your opinions, and your experiences. Um, definitely really enjoyed your talk. Um, I had a question about your ICE acronym. Um, I definitely like your philosophy of you should think about positive things in your life, um, especially when you have problems. But I was wondering. Um, By focusing on the good, aren't you in inevitably focusing on the larger situation, which is your problem? Um, and also, if you're only focusing on the good, do you believe that you, there are some problems that you should not solve? Yeah. So when you're focusing on the good, are we not uh, focusing on the bigger situation, and are we accepting that some problems we should not solve? It's not that we should not solve. it is that we have to optimize the use of our energies that means we are finite beings and in our own life as well as in the external world around us there are so many things that can be improved 
if you look at our own abilities you may say i can develop this skill i can develop this skill i can develop this skill or i can overcome this weakness i can overcome this weakness there's so much we can work on so we have to prioritize on which problems to deal with and which problems to live with so if we don't do this prioritization some problems may be just said that they're just not solvable and if we don't learn to live with them then we just dissipate our energy completely now how do we decide which problems to deal with and which problems to live with some things are just it's obvious they're beyond our capacity to change say if we come from india from a say place like south india or mumbai to america now america is so cold and we may find that i find this cold very difficult to bear but can't do anything about it this is the atmosphere if i have to study over here i have to build my career over here i have to learn to live with it so some problems we easily understand that i can't deal with them then we accept them now some problems we think we can deal with them but when we deal with them we find that we're getting nowhere so then we may have to move that problem from the deal with category to the live with category so that that doesn't mean that we accept defeat it simply means that we learn to channel our energy where it is productive mm -hmm. and some problems just require the right time also for the solution so we may decide that right now this problem i can't deal with maybe in future in a better situation i can deal with the problem so by focusing on the bigger situation we are not blinding ourselves to the specific it's just that we are not obsessing over the specific problem that we have we may have to live with pain but we don't have to live in pain live with pain means pain is a part of our life it is a companion in our life but live in pain means that pain consumes our consciousness it becomes a container of our consciousness we live with pain means pain is contained in our consciousness yes you know we may have some family situations a family member in india may be sick or some so many situations can be there if we are obsessing over them then we live with pain we can't do anything constructive but live in pain means we accept this problem is there and in my situation this is what i can do to do to deal with it and in my situation i can't do much about other things so let me live with it so that is just a pragmatic utilization of our energy and focusing on the big picture it doesn't mean blinding ourselves to the specific problem but it just means not obsessing over the specific does it address your question okay yes please um so like suppose i took your advice and uh, you know i'm trying to deal with an issue um but you know we're trying to move on um but what do you do when you know like humans are social people you keep hearing about this problem over and over and you know like there's others uh like obsessing over the problem and not dealing it just like continuously thinking about that problem and you're trying to move on but they're kind of like blasting this problem onto you even though you're moving forward what do you do yeah good question if we want to move on from a particular problem and the opposite if some other people are just obsessing over the problem and they are imposing that problem on us what do we do at that time yes it said that some people bring happiness wherever they go and some people bring happiness whenever they go <laughs> some people bring happiness wherever they go some people bring happiness whenever they go some people you know as soon as we see them we start feeling our heartbeat increasing not because of excitement but because of uh, because of worry because of tension and talking with them is like walking on a landmine you don't know what will cause a explosion <laughs> so at that time uh, if we find that they are obsessing with the issue over a issue which which either can't be dealt with or we can't deal with it then we just have to we can start please taking food no need to so we can start off thank you so we don't have to obsess we don't we can keep a safe distance from them generally it is 
it is polite to try to acknowledge others feelings if somebody feels very strongly about a problem that's why they may be speaking about it and we can acknowledge their feelings but we need to gently and firmly redirect the essence of the discussion you can say yes i understand this hurt you at this time i don't see whether we can do anything about it right now i can't do anything about it so let's discuss something else we can be explicit like that we can be more discreet depending on time place circumstance but we have to redirect the discussion if we can't redirect it then just we may have to create a distance we don't have to let other let negativity others bring their negativity on to us so if they expect us to deal with that problem and that's why they are speaking it to us then we may have to clarify that this is what i have done this is what i am doing but beyond this at this time i can't do these things so in general so when people bring negativity to into our lives it's it's broadly you can classify into three things that one is the problem is with them they themselves are negative people they uh, it's like some people find solution to every problem and some people find problems with every solution so if the when some people are bringing negativity it could be the problem is with them if the problem is with them only then best to keep a distance from them sometimes the problem may be with the situation itself and something has happened which has hurt them terribly and that situation any of us say if we if we fall down we get a fracture the wound is there and we can't deny the wound so sometimes whatever negativity is spouting it's simply because of the situation then we can be patient and understanding the situation recedes in the background they also heal themselves emotionally and things come back to normal that time we might just have to act like a <clears throat> buffer where they speak the negativity but we try to protect our, we we hear it is to give them a sympathetic empathetic ear but we don't get carried away by it we have to see whether we have the resilience to do that if we get carried away by it again we may have to create a distance but sometimes it might be circumstantial that situation is what is hurting them situation goes it's dealt with third could be that the problem is with us that means we have done some mistake and they want us to acknowledge that this was your mistake and you should have not done like this you should have done like this and then we may do the needful at that time we may acknowledge and this is uh, acknowledge apologize amend whatever we can generally if the if we are responsible for something these are three things we need to do three a's acknowledge this this was my mistake i acknowledge the gravity of it a is second is apologize clearly said no it i am sorry about it and i meant to do what we can to correct it then maybe see more often than not when people speak something negative they want to feel understood it's not so much that they want us to amend things sometimes some things have happened and they just can't be changed but the human heart needs understanding the 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 we could say the heart is the metaphorical conceptual heart the emotional heart it needs understanding as much as our body needs oxygen if we don't feel understood we feel choked so then if we help people to understand we convey to them that we have understood and that itself may decrease the negativity so based on where the locus of the problem is in them in the situation or in us we may respond with somewhat uh, with somewhat variable ways but the essence is that we have to we have to help ourselves before we can help others we can try to direct them to become more positive but if they are not moving on we have to move on in our life is that answer question thank you any other questions or comments yes yeah, please i have a few um what does overthinking and underthinking have to do with spirituality okay what does uh, overthinking and underthinking have to do with spirituality excellent question i said there are three parts to it the first part is that when we overthink about something at that time why, why do we overthink because we have invested ourselves too much into that situation it's say if we are in a relationship with someone and then that relationship seems to be breaking then some people when the relationship seems to be break, breaking it's like they may become so depressed they may even become suicidal because they have 
invested themselves so much into that relationship that they see that relationship not as a as simply a as a disruption in the interaction between the two they start thinking that something must be wrong with me maybe i am unloved i am unlovable i am useless i am hopeless so we overthink a situation because we have we have identified ourselves excessively with that situation so we have become caught in that situation in that interaction in that role in that relationship so our spirituality helps us to rise above that now we understand that we are spiritual beings and at our core we are indestructible so we have horizontal relationship with others in our life but we also have a vertical relationship with our source with the divine and that is our defining relationship so when by our spirituality we understand our indestructibility when our by our spirituality we understand that uh, i am loved by the divine no matter what happens in my life then when we face some disruption in our relationships at the horizontal level we don't obsess so much over them so overthinking happens because we over invest ourselves we over identify ourselves with whatever roles or responsibilities or relationships we may be having uh, as underthinking is because of callousness we just not we just not being responsible enough underthinking also happens because we have adopted a extremely casual approach towards life so that in in the bhagavad gita which is yoga text <coughs> it describes that there are three broad mode ways of thinking of approaching life it is called sattva rajas and tamas it refers to we could say having doing and being in the person the lowest consciousness identified themselves with what they have i have this car i have this degree i have this partner therefore i am someone good if i don't have any of these things i am no one good mm-hmm. doing means oh i have this career i am doing this i am doing this therefore i am someone worthwhile but being means this is who i am and i am secure in my sense of self being in in in, my, in a secure in my spiritual identity so when in we are in the lower levels of consciousness we either overthink or lower think overthink or underthink but when you rise to a spiritual level of consciousness we understand how much thinking is adequate or is is useful for dealing with the problem does that answer your question yeah um that that leads into i was going to ask this last but what if what if trauma associated with pain makes it difficult or impossible to use spirituality to overcome the problem mm. why would trauma make it impossible to be spiritual because you can't focus because the trauma is taking so much from you okay so if trauma makes it impossible to focus on spirituality then we have to recognize that spirituality doesn't necessarily have to be reduced to one activity or even one set of activities no matter how much traumatized someone has been they still have their own interests they still have their own talents they may not feel like doing anything at that time say somebody faced a terrible trauma in their life but still they like music now if you tell them to read a spiritual text to study the philosophy that they may just not be able to do at that time but if you look at the circle of what someone's interests are and then we look at the circle of spirituality we can find where these two circles intersect and then try to become spiritual through the intersection between the two so somebody may not be able to attend uh, talks or even hear philosophy read philosophy but they might just be able to hear some soothing music hear some spiritual music that may calm them down for some people it might be that they they, they are good at doing things with their hands they start moving around get out of their head and start doing something physically in a spiritual setting for a spiritual cause spirituality is not reduced to some particular activity it is inclusive so the way we can 
uh, find out that is that requires initiative on the part of that person as well on the part of the spiritual mentors of that person where can the two intersect the circle of natural interest of the person and the circle of their spirituality from there they can become spiritual in spite of the trauma okay thank you does does the music have to be spiritual or can is music just inherently spiritual good question does music have to be spiritual or does is music intrinsically spiritual there are two ways to three broad ways in which you can understand whether some we can evaluate whether something is spiritual or not it is intent its content and its consequence the intent means okay with what intention did somebody do this if somebody has done it simply with the purpose of becoming famous earning a lot of money and they have done it with self uh, self selfish mot self centered motives then then that is not going to lead to much spirituality in that music content means what is it talking about if the music is talking about uh, is just a rant against the world about violence about destruction about pessimism then that content also is not going to be spiritual so spiritual music can be centered on mantras there are divine chants so these are sounds which are intrinsically spiritual and if their new music is set around that then the spiritual spiritual con content of them is huge and then the consequence so we have to see that what is the result of hearing something does that raise my consciousness does that make me more positive does that broaden my vision of my life or does it actually have a negative effect on me so it it's not that music you could say music is is intrinsically spiritualizable but it is not intrins not all music is intrinsically spiritual it okay okay yes please Could you apply that to more than just music, like the intent, content, and consequence? Yes, in general. Like exactly, like with art and other. Like. Like, like with art. Oh yeah, of course, for all fields. In fact, I have a whole seminar on this. That these three intent, content, and consequence, we can look at these for making decisions in our life also at large in any field. So, in theory, like not necessarily everything, but most things. Yeah, can most things be spiritual? Yeah, there's definitely most things, but I would say not intrinsically spiritual. They can be spiritualized. There has to be the direction of consciousness going in the spiritual. See, if you look at this three-level model, the uh, the hardware, software, and user, then we understand that spirituality is not just a state of the mind. it is a state of being there's a higher level of reality which is spiritual so if we consider if reality to be like three level then it's a three level building from the level 1 level 2 level 3 so level 1 is physical reality level 2 is mental reality and level 3 is spiritual reality so anything at level 1 or level 2 can become a tool for us to life rise to level 3 there are some tools which are intrinsically useful for going through to level 3 but is the intent to go to level 3 is the content something which helps us to go to level 3 and at the end of it have i actually gone to level 3 now how do i know that i have gone to level 3 to the spiritual level the, when we are at the spiritual level what happens at level 1 and level 2 even if it concerns us it doesn't disturb us if we are at level 1 level 2 we will get swept away by it we'll be overwhelmed by it so if we are level to listen to level listen to level 3 then we will will we still be concerned because we have to deal with it but we won't be overwhelmed by it so spiritual many times we think of spiritual as anything that makes us feel good yes there are many things which can make us feel good but that feeling good might just be at level 2 at the mental level this makes me feel good no it's taking drugs can make people feel good just uh, spending time hours and hours watching movies can make people feel good 
But whether that is making them spiritual, that's, that's questionable. So, uh, to conclude this point, that just at the physical level, if somebody is in pain, we can have a painkiller which just covers the pain and we can have a curative medicine. The painkiller can also be useful if the patient is in a lot of pain. But the painkiller is not the curative medicine. Although the painkiller can also help a person to feel good. But they need the curative medicine if they are going to actually be cured. So similarly, there may be many things which can help us feel good. But they may be like painkillers. Most entertainment, if it doesn't have a component of enlightenment within it, it doesn't have a component that points to spiritual level of reality, then it is like a painkiller. It helps. It helps us to feel good. But the underlying cause has not been dealt with. But that which takes us to the level 3, the spiritual level of reality, that is like a curative medicine. Have a whole culture of music, art, dance, drama, centered on spiritual sound. Especially we chant the mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So this mantra is like an elevator. The, when we chant the mantra, we get our consciousness to enter into that sound. We let the consciousness enter into our, uh, we let the sound enter into our consciousness. As the sound, we find that our consciousness starts arising. As it rises upwards, it comes to the spiritual level. Can I answer your question? Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I have one more. I'll just come back to you. Does anyone else have questions? You don't know. What was the book? Which one? That your friend gave you. What was the book your friend gave you? Like you said when you were uh, <laughs> way back, you got the book and I'm you were so absorbed in the book that you forgot. You forgot about the chess match. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Mm. At that time, it, it was just a. It is a book about language. It is a book of. Uh, words with uh, at that time we didn't have Wikipedia or online dictionaries so it was like uh, one of my hobbies in childhood was to just pick up dictionaries and look at words and memorize the meanings of words so it was a book <laughs> <laughs> so it was a it was a book <laughs> so it was a book that had something like the thousand words which have the maximum meanings like say the i believe the word run has something like several hundred meanings to it so the, I, i'm running for elections that's very different from i'm going for a jog or a run so is the computer running properly so, so like that so these were the words which had this was a book which had uh, that list of the words which have the maximum meanings so it was fascinating to look at each word. Okay, what does this mean? Where have I heard this meaning being used? How can I use this word in this meaning? So that's how I got absorbed in it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? I was so intrigued about the book. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you for the question. <laughs> yeah. We'll come back to this. Um, yeah, so about the, um, it was about the thought experiment. Um, how is visualization a, um, a mental component when the brain, which is a physical component of your body, is necessary in order to uh, do visualization? Okay. How is visualization at the uh, 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 mental exercise when the brain is required for visualization the brain is a part of the physical body good question thank you at at the present level of experience our consciousness comes from the physical through the ment sorry from the consciousness comes from the spiritual level the soul to the physical to the through the mental to the physical so anything that we experience right now there is a physical channel for that. Mm. See, even when we chant spiritual sounds, if we chant a mantra, now that mantra, we are going to use our throat for that. Mm. So now the throat is the tool. 
it is not the content the two if we go back to the intent content and consequence you know when if we have to do anything at the anything at the material level of reality anything with at our present level of consciousness anything right now it is going to be expressed at the physical level but the focus is not at the physical level i'll give a simple example say if i have a computer and with that computer i'm watching a movie then or say i'm watching a sports match that is happening somewhere else then that computer becomes a tool to a reality which is elsewhere something which is happening elsewhere now for that i am using the computer screen so that so it's one physical reality the computer screen which is used to show me another physical reality which is the sports stadium but now i want to i want to debug my computer then at that time i am going to use the same hardware of the computer but then i will use the hardware i'll operate i'll operate some programs by which what will be shown on my computer will be all the software is over there and then if i if i run the debugging program say okay this program needs to be updated this program is corrupted this program is working fine so i am seeing it all on the physical screen itself but what i am seeing in the physical screen does not pertain to physical reality i am using the hardware to see it but what i am seeing through the hardware is the software the state of the software so similarly for any kind of experience at present our brain will be involved but the brain is the tool the brain is not the source the brain is the tool the channel through which things are happening it is not the source of it but for humans for brains where both the instrument and because we have the senses so we touch something we feel it but that touching comes from both the nerves here that feel it and from our brain interpreting it correct all connected so i okay i get your question let me try to explain this in another way there's uh, i was in toronto last year i mean this year only last semester so there i mean i was giving a talk so toronto one of the uh, for canada one of their most famous scientists is dr wilder benfield he is a new, neuroscientist considered the father of brain surgery and he studied the human brain for almost 40 years and he wrote several books the last of his books was the mystery of the mind and he had this idea which is mainstream scientific notion that the brain is the source of consciousness right hmm? and he basically if people were getting fits attacks then he found that if you remove certain parts of the brain then the fits decrease right. so he could remove certain parts of the brain and then while he was doing this he started he did various experiments involving the brain so one typical one experiment which is quite striking was that we know now more or less which part of the brain correlates with which bodily function so there is say the parietal lobe is which can occur, which correlates with the motor function so if that part of the brain is activated then say the hand rises or falls so he observe he asked the subject to raise their hand the subject raised their hand they found that that part of the brain was activated is asked subject describe the event so i raised my hand then he asked the subject to lower the hand he lowered the hand that part got uh the deactivated and he asked what happened he said i lowered my hand mm -hmm. then through external probes dr Pen penfield activated that part of the brain when he activated that part of the brain the hand went up and he asked the subject what happened he says my hand went up <coughs> did you raise your hand no i didn't you did and then he deactivated that part of the brain that electrode and then the hand fell down so what happened my hand fell down did you put your hand down i didn't you did so so now the implication of this 
is that if to understand this let's compare it to simple ex uh, experiment say if I have a computer here and I have a printer over here and I have a print button as soon as I print, press the print button and the printer hand starts moving and the printing starts happening in the first case so we can consider the pr print button to be like the brain center which controls the motor, motor, mo motor motions motor the nervous control system motor functions of the body so and then the printer hand is like the hand which moves up and down so in the first case it was Dr. Penfield who, it was the subject who pressed the button like my computer I press the button I raise my hand I lowered my hand in the second case who pressed the button the second case was Dr. Penfield so you know you came and you raised it but in the second case the person said I am not doing it so then he said I am not doing it I am observing you do it what this means is that the brain is a physical tool like a print button and the person who is using the brain is different from the brain so Dr. Penfield's conclusion was that the brain is like a computer but it is programmed by something outside of itself and Dr. Uh, William James who is considered the father of in some ways the father of psychology he gave the example that the brain is like a prism and consciousness is like the light so when light goes to the prism the light comes out in different colors and the prism gets damaged and the light doesn't come out of the same patterns so the brain is not the generator of consciousness the brain is the transmitter of consciousness and the same experiment is vindicated by what the same thesis is vindicated by Dr. Penfield's findings and in our thought experiment now if you go backwards uh, our thought experiment we will use the brain for visualization no doubt but the visualizer is different from both what is visualized and what is used for visualizing the visualizer who is who is visualizing is different from what is being visualized and what is being used to be visualized the, but that's that's where i'm stuck because our concept of self is something that develops because of our brain so you can like well like on a regular level yes our self is separate from what we perceive both of our sense of self and what we perceive both of those processes happen in the brain in different places but they both happen in the brain yeah that's a good point that the the sense of self developed from the brain the two different things over here one is that the, the self acts through the brain but is the self itself the product of the brain? That is, that is, that is there's nothing in science that can prove it. That's a, that's a presumption. It's an operational assumption that science uses that the sense of selfhood comes from the brain. But going further, Dr. Penfield tried to repeat this experiment by he had the subject raise the hand and lower the hand intentionally and unintentionally through the probe of the electrode and then while doing this he also activated other parts of the brain and then he observed whether any part of the brain when activated would give the subject the sense of agency that I am the doer and no matter whichever part of the brain was activated many different things happen if some part of the brain was activated suddenly subject started saying that I am remembering a conversation that I had when I was five years old with my grandmother or oh I'm seeing a I'm feeling the fragrance of a flower they got many many experiences but in all of them the sense the self was the observer the, the, the brain activation of the brain triggered certain experiences but this but no part of the brain when triggered would give the sense of self to that the sense the sense of selfhood and anyway if at all we want to say the sense of selfhood emerges from the brain that there are severe 
conceptual problems with that also. Because why? Because all parts of the brain give rise to certain sensations which we experience. But there is no one center of the brain which is connected to all parts of the brain. So there is no one cell in the brain which is connected to all other cells. So where does that sense of self reside? If it's coming from the brain, which part of the brain is it coming from? There are, there are surgeries, hemisphere, hemispherectomy is a surgery, but you can cut off half of the brain. And still the sense of selfhood remains. Not only that, there are cases where there are people who have had near-death experiences. So I have a book on reincarnation where I describe the, the near-death experience of Pam Reynolds. She had an aneurysm at the bottom of her brain. And the doctors told her, you can't survive. Uh, it's impossible. But then finally she came to know of her doctor the particular extremely daring and dangerous operation called Operation Standstill. In this operation, she agreed to do that operation and then she was subjected to it. So what was the operation all about? First, she is given complete anesthesia. And after the anesthesia is given complete unconsciousness, then an artificial cardiac arrest is induced in the body so that the heart stops pumping blood and then the blood to the brain is stopped then after that uh, when the anesthesia is fully activated then the heart has stopped beating the brain has stopped giving out any waves induced coma, yeah and it is basically induced coma uh, from a biological from a physiological biological perspective you could say the person is dead at that time yeah. and then the body is tilted in such a way that all the blood comes out of the brain and at this time, then the cranial cavity is opened and the, the brain is picked out. Literally, the brain you pick out of the cranial cavity. And then you pick out the brain and then you reach down to the bottom of the brain where the aneurysm is there. And then you cut off the aneurysm. So now in this case, uh, it was in such a situation when she had been given this aneurysm, she, she was undergoing this operation that she had an out-of-body experience. And she described that she saw herself from a perspective above her body, above the operation, operating theatre. And the first thing she saw was that her hair was cut in a very peculiar way. Hey, why have they done that? And then she saw that somebody was doing something with her near her groin. This is a brain surgery. Why are they doing anything with my groin? And then she heard a female voice saying that the veins are very small over here. And then she heard a male voice saying that, okay, try on the other thigh. And then she further went on hearing the conversation. And then she felt herself rising and going to a different level of reality. And then when she came back to consciousness, she reported this. And there are the medical transcripts of the operation which are put together in the records. And this exact conversation had happened. And not only the conversation had happened, but also all the details were right about. And she described several other details also about what she observed in the operating theatre. Now none of these are generic, none of this is generic information that she could have guessed. Uh, by her general knowledge of surgery. She was not a medical student at all. She didn't have any background in medicine. But the more important thing is that to ensure that during this operation standstill, she's unconscious. They had earphones tied to her ears. And those earphones were, were emitting high decibel sounds. Like say, uh, a train whistle and at an extremely high frequency, almost 70 to 80 times a second. Sorry, uh, very, very fast, 70 to 80 times a minute. So with that kind, now that sound is required in the ears because the ears are very sensitive to sound. Like when we're sleeping, we wake up through the alarm. So they have to make sure that the person is unconscious. So if there is no general response in the brain, even to that level of the sound, that means the person is really unconscious. So she had that kind of earplugs, uh, generating that kind of sounds in her ear. 
so when that loud a sound is going on with that frequency how could she conceivably have heard a conversation that happened at a normal conversational level which well she now when she was asked she said that i didn't even hear those sounds those clicking sounds i heard it, she says i heard by non physical means let me conclude this so basically normally when we experience there's the body there's the mind there's the, there's the consciousness there's the mind and there's the body so normally our experience is mediated through the mind through the body through the brain through the outer world but in out of body experiences the self comes out of the body and the self can observe from an out of body perspective so when the brain is biologically not functioning still the sense of self is there so that means the sense of self is not a product of the brain okay okay um, can we continue at a one to one level if yeah. you don't mind i think others have to go yeah, sure. We'll talk afterwards. Thank you very much for your thoughtful questions. Thank you for your participation also. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much, Chetan Chan, for uh, coming and enlightening us. Like this talk was just like loaded with so many practical points that we can use to deal with.